about yourselves. Uh, so raise your hand, I guess, if you're from uh, Wellesley. Nobody at Wellesley wants to fly, OK? <laughs> Harvard. OK, everybody else can boo. Uh, who's not, who has no MIT affiliation? All right, awesome. Well, welcome. Um, uh, who actually, yeah, raise your hand if you've never been in a light aircraft, if you have no experience in a little airplane. Okay. That's good. That's a good number. For the, for the MIT folks, uh, how, many are you, how many of you are undergrads? Okay, that's a good number. How many of you are graduate students? It's an even larger number. <laughs> and uh, how many of you are um, neither? You're just like an MIT alum or staff? Just a few. Okay, great. Well, welcome all of you. And let's just go through the goals. Let's see what, who's in the room. Who wants to eventually fly an airplane? Whoa. How about a helicopter? Good. I'm happy to see that. Uh, what about uh, drones? <laughs> All right. That's a larger number than last year. That's great. All right. So your course objectives um, are to uh, get ready for your official FAA uh, knowledge test. Um, this is sometimes called the written test as opposed to the practical test or the check ride that you do at the end of your uh, flight training. Uh, it's available in a bunch of different versions, including for uh, airplanes and helicopters. Uh, we're going to concentrate in this class on airplane, uh, partly because of the show of hands. Uh, you will also be prepared, though, uh, for the FAA's remote pilot test if you decide to go direct entry into the world of commercial drones. Uh, we hope that this. Uh, is also going to help you. Uh, any kind of thorough study usually helps you make more efficient use of your uh, in-aircraft time. And because uh, we have Tina here uh, with her PhD in AeroAstro, you're going to learn something about the engineering as well. Um, so what is great about aviation? Um, you know, People were dreaming about flying a long time ago, uh, going back to the ancient Greeks. Only recently we've been able to do it, which is a good thing. Uh, one thing I like about it is uh, to look at the geology um, and the organization of human settlement on the planet. It's, uh, there's a lot of interesting structural patterns that one can see uh, from above. Um, flying, you know, a lot of the greatest engineering achievements of the last uh, 100 years or so are embodied in the aircraft that uh, you, know, you can personally go down to uh, the local airport rent and fly. Um, also, you know, a lot of MIT, everybody at MIT is pretty good at doing stuff at a desk and thinking um, about hard problems when sitting at a desk. But there's no emotions to manage uh, other than depression. Uh, <laughs> so you know, flying combines everything. You might be a little bit afraid. It's not natural to be up in the air. So you're working all of your human capacities at one time. You're managing your fear. You're working your brain to think about what's coming next. And uh, you're also uh, working your muscles. Uh, finally, uh, you, know, you can get to the beach quickly. Um, but as I note here, you know, most places, uh, unfortunately, little airplanes, when you factor in the weather and all the training that you have to do, uh, a lot of times uh, you, you could have gotten door to door faster. I might, I might also just ask a couple of you guys, pretty much everyone raised their hand about wanting to fly. So maybe we can just get here from a couple of you. Why do you want to fly? What's your interest in taking the course? Yes. Uh, I'm uh, also a PhD student in Air Astro, and so like you learn all the theory for now like five years already, and then I think it's a normal step to like want to do it yourself. That's great. So just uh, for the folks that couldn't hear, um, uh, and what's your name? Lawrence. Lawrence. Lawrence was saying he's a PhD student in, in aerospace engineering and has learned all the theory, and so it's a natural step to want to go and do it yourself. That's great. All right. Can you do it? Uh, yes, as in fact, um, 
appears on the slide here, there are a whole bunch of little airports uh, near us, so we'll show them um, on a subsequent slide. They all have uh, flight schools, and you can rent either airplanes or helicopters, or both, uh, as well as find an instructor to teach you. Uh, you can actually learn to fly in about 10 hours. To me, it's a little bit unfortunate that so much emphasis is placed on getting a pilot certificate uh, because it is an independent achievement to actually be able to take off, cruise around, and land without the instructor having to uh, touch anything. So that achievement, unfortunately, isn't recognized with a little certificate. But that's actually learning to fly. The rest of the training, which uh, you know takes uh, three times as long as actually learning to fly, is directed at flying a broken aircraft or a lost aircraft. All this stuff that prepares you to be the only pilot in the aircraft, which may not even be a goal. For passengers, they would rather have two pilots in the front, not just one pilot. But uh, there's a bizarre focus on training one person to do everything, which we'll get into a little bit more. OK, so here's our local area. And watch this fancy device here. Whoa. So we're somewhere between Logan Airport on the bottom right and Hanscom Field, um, which is surrounded by a dashed uh, blue line telling you it's a towered airport. So those are the two closest airports, I think. Uh, Norwood is just about as close. I'll show that right here on the uh, lower left of the figure. Uh, these airports that are um, in a, a magenta color, those don't have control towers. Uh, over here is Beverly, uh, and here's Lawrence. I think we've covered the airports that MIT folks most normally fly out of, but there's also uh, Nashua not too far away. So there are you're surrounded by airports, even if uh, Logan is the one that you're most familiar with. Hanscom Field is the most substantial of the airports. This is only about a third of the ramp space and hangars and structures built up around Hanscom. That's a picture that I took from uh, uh, Robinson R44 helicopter, which you guys could be flying in next week. Um, and Tina's going to tell you uh, what she likes to do on a typical trip. So we heard from a couple of you that um, are observers or participants in the MIT Flying Club. Did anyone participate in the flyout a couple years ago to Maine, to Bar Harbor? All right. <laughs> so this is a picture uh, from that flight to Bar Harbor. Just grab the clicker from you. Thanks. So if you were to drive, you know, we took off just as uh, Philip was describing, one of the nearby airports is at Hanscom. So we, we took off from Hanscom. If you were to drive, it would be a four and a half hour drive to get there and back. So it wouldn't really be something that you could easily do as a day trip. But since we're flying, it was a great day trip. So we flew up along the coast all the way to Bar Harbor. And what was really great about that is that we could go hiking. So this was the, um, all these folks flew in little airplanes from the Boston area th through the MIT Flying Club. And we all flew up to Bar Harbor, Maine, and then we went hiking in the Acadia woods and forests. It was really beautiful, wonderful day. And then we flew back um, and landed just after sunset back here. So it was a really beautiful experience and a lot of fun to fly along the coastline. So I highly recommend it. If you're looking for a longer trip. So uh, I designed this. You can check it out on my web blog. It is a. Uh, trip in a little Cirrus that'll take you to all 48 states in uh, just 18 days and only about 50 hours of flight time. And that's a pretty standard little airplane. But more importantly, so people who, I just came back from Bentonville, Arkansas. And uh, there's a guy there who's the grandson of Sam Walton, the founder of Walmart. So uh, he can pretty much do anything he wants. And what does he like to do? He has a couple P-51 Mustangs. Uh, he was flying alongside this little game bird aerobatic plane that we were testing out. Uh, he's got a, um, a Super Corsair. There were only 10 built. Uh, he started his little, a little flight school at the local airport. He flies his uh, little Phenom 300 uh, business jet all over the world. So, um, you know, I think that's a proof that flying is fun because people who could do anything that they want to do 
uh, also fly. You're going to meet people from all around the world of all different ages. Uh, it's a very diverse uh, group, uh, especially if you like older guys. Um, <laughs> which I do. Um, is it safe? Okay, so we're going to show you how to make it safe. Uh, it's not safe statistically uh, compared to JetBlue, um, but that's not because little airplanes are feeble. Uh, as you'll see in this class, I think it's because of the way that uh, people have been flying them. So we're going to show you how if you train like the airlines and fly like the airlines, you can be uh, get much closer to airline level of safety in little airplanes as long as you're a little bit conservative uh, with the weather. And if all else fails, if you're flying a uh, modern uh, design airplane, reach up and pull the parachute and the whole airplane will float down and you'll get out into a uh, swamp. <laughs> all right, I'm taking my... <laughs> I thought, I thought that uh, no, she was on next, but she's not. OK, so this is me. I was class of 82 at MIT. It was much more challenging then than it is for you guys. That's because the Wisconsin ice sheet was covering the campus to a depth of about 100 feet. So we had to tunnel our way from East Campus into the main buildings. Uh, I've been flying since 2002. I'm an instructor uh, at uh, East Coast Aero Club at Hanscom Field. Uh, I was uh, also a regional jet pilot. I decided to learn to fly jets, and there's no way to, better way to do that than at the airlines. Um, so I flew uh, a 50-seat regional jet called the CRJ, the Canada Regional Jet for Delta. I have type ratings, which we'll get into later. You need specific licensing for each turbojet-powered aircraft that you fly. Uh, so I've got two of those. For um, One of them is for the smallest uh, Cessna business jet. Uh, I usually fly, though, these days a four-seat Cirrus, um, a Robinson R44, a four-seat helicopter, and a Pilatus uh, PC-12, uh, which holds uh, either uh, 11 people total or 60 sea turtles, um, which we'll get into a little bit later. So this is a little bit about me. Um, in the top left corner, you'll see me. I'm actually sitting in a Cessna 172 here at Hanscom, and I'm doing my engine run-up. And uh, what do you see out the, out the window? Does anyone recognize it? An F-18. So, so what's really cool is that this airport that I fly out of, Hanscom, is also a military uh, air force base, which is really exciting because upon occasion, you'll actually see military jets come out. And they, of course, did not wait for me, even though I was first in line. Um, they, ni they nicely cut in front. They're, they called themselves Jet 1 and Jet 2. And they went out. And uh, it really looked like they didn't take any space at all um, to any of the runway length to take off. It really looked, from where I was sitting, kind of right next to it, like they, like they just turned like a rocket ship and took off. And it was, it was really amazing. Um, Oops, sorry, Dina. No problem. So this is just a, a picture of me um, just going on a flight with some other uh, MIT folks in the area. And then, of course, if all else fails, you can just jump out. So a little bit of background. So I'm I'm also Aero Astro, um, just like you, Lawrence. And so I I studied Course 16 here. I did my undergrad in 2009, and I was really passionate about it and um, continued on. And I did the MIT System Design and Management program for my master's degree, and then continued on in an interdepartmental PhD across Aero Astro, Engineering Systems, and Sloan. It's a really great experience. Um, one of the things. That got me really excited about it is that when I was an undergrad in the Core 16 department, we were developing a satellite, and we needed to test that satellite. So we actually got to go on a zero gravity flight. So I don't know, has anyone heard of a zero gravity flight or the Vomit Comet? All right, so a couple folks didn't raise their hands. So the idea is that uh, the plane flies in a parabolic trajectory. And um, much like a roller coaster, when you're at the top of the parabola or the top of the roller coaster, you know how your stomach feels like it's lifting? All right, we're getting some head nods. The rest of you guys really need to go on a roller coaster. 
Um, so when you get that, you can actually, when an airplane flies like that, you can have everyone inside the airplane kind of float up and have that sensation of zero gravity um, or microgravity. It lasts about 30 seconds. And that's also how they film certain movies like Apollo 13 to show the astronauts in weightlessness. So we use that to test our satellite. So it was a really great experience. It got me really excited about things. And then I felt very similar to you that I wanted to see the theory in action. And so I um, became a pilot. Um, uh, in terms of my professional career, I developed electronic warfare systems. I went on to Raytheon. I was the chief engineer of a $40 million advanced radar and electronic warfare uh, system. Um, now I'm into entrepreneurship and have my own company in the security space. And I've been a pilot since 2012. And I love flying with the MIT Flying Club. And um, I'm currently working on my IFR. Who knows what an IFR stands for? Shout it out. Good job. Instrument flight rating. So if you don't know, that's fine. We're going to cover that. Um, so we'll explain it all. But um, right now, I fly a pretty much usually the training aircraft, the Cessna 172. It's a very, very safe and stable aircraft. So we'll talk about a bunch of different aircraft. All right. So um, let's hope that you've uh, done the pre-reading. If you hadn't, uh, you know, I know everybody here in this room, at least uh, the MIT and Harvard folks are good at the book stuff. So uh, please do hit the books. Uh, some of the thornier and less interesting uh, topics, we're going to rely on you to uh, read through the books. So don't worry if you get everything in the class. We're giving you kind of the highlights that are in the books. And passing is 70 on the test. All right, uh, optional supplies. Um, just for your reference, if you, you know, study a typical flight student, a lot of them will have uh, a non-FAA textbook. It's not necessary, but some people like the different perspective. There's a free online one that we reference later that's written by a PhD physicist, which is uh, kind of interesting. Uh, a lot of people have in hard copy a big, thick book called Far Aim with the regulations and the FAA's overall um, guidance on uh, how to use airports and uh, electronic navigation. Uh, there uh, are test preparation books that you can get and electronic versions of this that just give you sample tests. You're going to use one of the uh, websites from the King schools that's a popular vendor for those. Um, and then before your check ride, you'll be reading the Airman certification standards. The FAA still uses kind of sexist language. There's Airman and Airmen for all pilots. Um, and this is, uh, tells you what you need to demonstrate when you're uh, getting uh, your final check. Most people will also buy uh, their own personal headset. Uh, the noise canceling ones make life a lot better. Uh, light speed is probably a little more rugged than Bose. Bose is more comfortable on the ears. Uh, the front desk of a typical flight school will have all this stuff for sale. Uh, the process, a lot of people wonder, well, how do I get to my private pilot's license? Uh, <clears throat> you need the flight training. Uh, you apply for a student pilot certificate on an FAA website. I don't know if that's still running completely. I just renewed the registration for an aircraft. So that part of the FAA is running. I don't know if they're sending out student uh, pilot certificates during the shutdown or not. Um, you have to do one medical exam in your life, at least, uh, with an aviation um, uh, doctor who's uh, been blessed by the FAA. And you get your third class medical. Uh, after, eventually, you'll be able just to go to your regular doctor if you want. Um, then you take this knowledge test, and that's what uh, you're being prepped for in this class. Um, and finally, you'll do your practical exam with an FAA designated examiner, one of whom should actually be here tomorrow. So you can ask him how he tortures people uh, on the check ride. I actually, uh, I had to take one. You have to do you know, a lot of these steps over again when you do a type rating for a new aircraft. So when I worked at the airline, uh, the oral, there was a guy who was famously harsh. And he would keep people uh, who were trying to fly the Canada regional jet uh, in knots for hours and have them sweating during the oral exam. And the first question he asked me, the airplane has these hydraulic pumps uh, that jet their AC motors. And it has the engines generating AC power. But a lot of the stuff runs on DC. And I'd really wondered about the electrical systems of the airplane. So I called up a friend of mine who's a physics professor at UC Berkeley. And we had a one hour discussion about when it made sense to generate AC and pipe that around the airplane and high voltage versus low voltage in DC. And uh, so I hung up and said goodbye to my friend Joel. 
And then uh, a few weeks later, there was the oral exam. And, and the first question the guy asked me was, and, I, and on my resume, I put on my resume that I just had a bachelor's degree. I didn't list any of my other degrees. Uh, I have a PhD in double ES, it happens. So um, <laughs> this guy who was the, uh, the bane of all the pilots at uh, this Delta subsidiary, he said, Philip, what, why does the airplane have both an AC and a DC system? So I gave him a little five-minute spiel based on my conversation with my physics professor friend. He said, OK, the, uh, oral, the oral's over. It's time to go into the simulator. <laughs> Didn't ask me another, a single other question. All right, so let's do the, the part that we should have done earlier. Now at least I know how to put on the mic. So it's conventional in religious settings to bring in a reformed sinner. <laughs> and that's what we have here. Somebody who's uh, found faith and is now living the faith. <laughs> Thank you so much, Philip and Tina, for having me here. Uh, I'm Meenakshi. I'm a fourth year PhD student at Harvard. Uh, I do neuroscience. And when I'm not trying to understand um, how the brain works, uh, I like to do most things adventurous. And I had really awesome friends who introduced me to the MIT Flying Club. So that was my first general aviation experience. Um, I was a passenger on a fly out to Republic Airport. It's in Long Island. Um, it's really nice because uh, most of the times, uh, if we get uh, cleared, we you get to fly over the Hudson and you real, get this really nice view of the New York skyline. Uh, so and oh. I the so the the other uh, photo is actually Philip and his sitter. So I was super lucky to be on another flyout as a passenger, and I got to fly in his um, in the sitter. So this was to Chatham, another really beautiful airport uh, in the Cape Cod. Uh, so all of that inspired me to become a pilot. But what really enabled me was precisely this course, because so I am doing my PhD in neuroscience. My aviation knowledge was literally like like Calvin it was like, okay, there are all these little button styles probably just have to check all those things and it's just like magic that the planes are flying. So I like this course was what really uh, laid the foundation for the aviation experience in the rest of my life. Uh, and Tina was uh, one of the instructors when I took the course. It was a slightly different format. It was over the entire semester, um, once a week. But um, I really enjoyed it. So at the end of it, I felt really ready to take uh, the practical flying lessons. So uh, I was a student pilot at East Coast Aero Club uh, at Bedford. So my two years of grad school stipend that I saved was like put to good, really good use. And uh, the, the picture on the left uh, is my my first solo, so that's the that's me doing the traffic pattern at Bedford. Uh, so like I it was I didn't have any like fancy electronic flight back then. It was just all paper maps. So that was just the GPS on my phone <laughs> tracking me uh, doing the traffic pattern at Bedford. And like you can see how happy I was with all my solos and <laughs> the smileys on my logbook. So uh, then, think end of September, got my private pilot's license. So I flew the Warrior. Um, so yeah, so that's the that's me after the check ride, after passing the check ride <laughs> in the Warrior. So after PPL, I uh, wanted to uh, I wanted to take spin training and did a little bit of aerobatics uh, in the Decathlon um, at East Coast. Uh, so Decathlon is a is a tailwheel aerobatic aircraft, and I, and, and like when when you do your PPL, they're always going to tell you, like, you, you, you will do stalls, and they're always going to tell you that, like, okay, you don't want to spin. So I was like, okay, I want to feel how it is going. Yeah. Maybe share what PPL stands for. Oh, sorry, yeah. PPL is private pilot's license, which is what all of us are here for. So, um, yeah, so after um, so after a little bit of aerobatics and spin training, so my recent flying experience has been a lot with the MIT Flying Club now as a pilot. So uh, this, so I did the same. The, the the first time I was ever on uh, the light aircraft was was this flyout with the MIT Flying Club to uh, Republic Airport, and and very recently I did that as a pilot, carrying like passengers um, uh, with the flying club. So that felt really nice. So you can you can see like. Um, over the Hudson, uh, 2,000 feet southbound towards Republic, and you get this really awesome view of the New York skyline. 
And yeah, it's it's really beautiful. You, you get to talk to like LaGuardia, New York, and I spoke to Kennedy Tower. That was like literally a dream come true for me. <laughs> so I would relive this moment like any number of times. I'm 500 feet uh, above the ground level, uh, and like you can see the the tiny shadow of my aircraft. I'm like talking to JFK, and I'm 500 feet because there are all these commercial um, uh, jets descending uh, to land at JFK. So it's it's a totally beautiful feeling. So I've also been flying with my friends, and like this is the Winnipesaukee Lake near Laconia, Yamshire. And uh, yeah, for the Howard folks, I think it's just one person. So you can probably recognize like Sanders Theater. So this is a city tour. Um, so you can get cleared into the Boston class Bravo airspace. And um, so you can, yeah, this is one of my friends who took photo of like the, yeah, uh, the Howard campus. So you can see Sanders Theater, Memorial Church, and just fall setting in. So when my mom visited me from India, I took her flying. So that was a very beautiful feeling, like to show her what this means to me, although she was totally terrified the whole time. <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess, I guess obviously I love it. I mean, it's really fun. The beautiful view is experience and like the super adrenaline and excitement every time I have the plane. And, and this, it is challenging. And there's really something like new, rewarding to learn from every single experience, every single flight, and of course the people. So yeah, thank you. And just uh, just sharing my experience from like having no aerostro background to being here. I hope it inspires. So a few. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much Matthew, for coming back and sharing your experience. So so that could be could be you guys next year. So a little bit about the FAA written exam. So as we said, sometimes it's called the written. That is the um, knowledge-based exam. So that is what ideally you'll be prepared to pass with flying colors. Um, so it's a computer-based multiple choice exam. Um, they usually give you about two and a half hours. And you don't necessarily need the whole time. There are 60 questions. And uh, they basically kind of shuffle those questions. So we're going to be teaching content somewhat that goes beyond this exam, because this is an MIT course. So we're actually going to teach a little bit more about the aerodynamics and, and how really planes fly and go a little bit beyond uh, just the course. But we will cover all of this material. And then, uh, so as, as Philip already said, to pass, you need a, a 70. But uh, we believe that you can, you can uh, score higher than that. So uh, we really encourage you to um, take this exam right after the course. So, uh, we can actually, uh, Philip can actually endorse your logbook, or um, you can we, you can actually print out a logbook and endorse you to take that written exam. So just following the course, the final exam of this course will be a practice FAA exam, and so you can take that. You can actually take it as many times as you want in order to pass, but hopefully you don't have to take it too many times. Um, and after that, we'll endorse you so that you can actually go take the actual FAA written exam and get that out of the way so you can be on your way to becoming a pilot. Uh, OK, so most East Coast uh, Aero Club, I'm an instructor there. Most of the people that I've seen will skim through at least the FAA books about three times before they take the test. They will use a test prep book. Uh, and uh, they end up getting, you know, a 98 or 100 on the exam. So they do a little bit, uh, uh, they go a little bit overboard if the goal is just to pass. Uh, again, if you have the physics uh, question, uh, physics type question, uh, we do recommend this free online textbook from this physics PhD. Uh, these presentations, of course, are all available from the course homepage. You can download them and follow all the links. Uh, as uh, Tina mentioned, I can endorse you. Uh, any Aero Astro majors who complain that it's too hard, remember that uh, everything that you're reading from the FAA is designed for somebody who's still in high school. <laughs> Tina? So this is just a sample question to give you a flavor. Um, obviously, we haven't taught you the material yet, but why don't we just take a minute to read this and then see if you guys can um, have a good guesstimate as to the answer. So I thought this would be appropriate given the weather conditions. You guys had to trudge through a lot of snow and slush to get here today. So here's a question about frost. Why is frost considered hazardous to flight? Thank you. 
Okay, who thinks it's A? Who thinks it's B? All right, who thinks it's C? All right, good job, guys. I mean, just generally icing bad for a plane. So, so anything that's really increasing lift or increasing control effectiveness, that's not what you're getting when you have frost. Uh, it's a bad thing. So we'll, we'll discuss this in more detail. All right, here's the, uh, the schedule for the next uh, couple days. Um, we'll just uh, talk about the parts that are fun. Uh, this afternoon, we're going to be visited by an F-22 pilot. Um, that's a little better than a uh, Cessna, Piper, or Cirrus in terms of performance, uh, if not in terms of uh, cost effectiveness. Uh, lunchtime, there's going to be pizza and uh, a slideshow about Oshkosh, the big aviation gathering that happens uh, in Wisconsin every year. Uh, tomorrow, you're going to hear from uh, a designated pilot examiner, uh, Mark Nathanson, who's an, also an aerobatics instructor and uh, a US Air Force uh, F-4 uh, fighter pilot uh, veteran. Day three, uh, Michael Hols Holsworth is going to come in. He's a local uh, drone pilot for Hollywood. Uh, so he'll tell you about uh, using the uh, commercial drone license to do something interesting. Um, at uh, lunch on day three, on Thursday, you're going to hear from uh, a uh, veteran. Actually, no, he's an active duty officer in the Brazilian Air Force who's here at MIT. And he's going to tell you about uh, being a test pilot. Um, and then at the end of the class, uh, we've tacked on um, the founder of ForeFlight, which is one of the most successful app aviation app companies. They're in a lot of uh, airline cockpits now as a replacement for paper. Uh, and they do a lot of flight planning. And so he's going to bring uh, himself to talk about you know, any questions you might have about starting a company uh, and being successful in business. And also one of his engineering folks, I think, to talk about the engineering behind the app. That's going to be a little bit more informal. It's optional. Uh, but we think it'll be interesting. Uh, OK, so welcome again. Um, and uh, now you're part of the community of aviators, at least as soon as you go uh, on your first MIT Flying Club uh, flyout. Uh, it is better to be on the ground wishing you were in the air than vice versa. <laughs> but people have been wishing to be in the air for tens of thousands of years. And uh, we think that, uh, well, we feel lucky to be some of the few who are able to control our own destiny uh, through the air. So now. It's time for questions. While you're formulating your brilliant questions, uh, enjoy these photos, which I snapped at the Reno Air Races, uh, where the Blue Angels, obviously, already visited. What's the five-minute spiel for the just fishing behind having an AC and an AC motor on the airplane? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> what is the, so what, yeah, what, why do you have both AC power and DC power on a uh, big jet? Uh, big jets, the flight controls are too heavy to be operated by a human, so you need hydraulic power. Basically, there may still be steel cables going out to the flight controls, but they're just modulating hydraulic pressure. How do you generate hydraulic pressure? There's a big uh, motor uh, to pump the hydraulics, and uh, it's easier to run a big motor with AC power compared to DC power. Um, so, and the engines are also spinning. So if you just think about Maxwell's equations, it's simpler to run AC for that, whereas the electronics, and also, of course, you can have higher voltage and transform it down. And then for uh, the electronics, uh, DC power is what they want. So that's why the DC's in there to run radios and so forth. <laughs> 